the mules are in the corral. Welcome to Mule Talk, and I'm Cindy K. Roberts, your host. On this week's episode, we have a reoccurring guest. She needs no introduction. This gal is on top of her game. We are going to be talking with Meredith Hodges from the Lucky Three Ranch. Meredith, welcome back to Mule Talk. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Good morning. We're talking about making up a trust for your mules and your pets. And when I visited with you, you shared with me about your plans and what you were intending to do. So tell us, how did you work up in your situation the trust for your animals? Well, this is a really touchy subject. And first of all, I might say that I thought it was going to be a whole lot easier than it was. Because in my mind, I loved my animals and I wanted, like anybody else, to make sure that if anything happened to me, that they would be well taken care of. But I found out in 2006, it was not that simple. Because you have to take into consideration uh, the people that you're going to uh, be designated if you decide to designate somebody to take care of them. Those people have to be willing to do it. And as we all know, uh, horse poor is the old saying. So taking on an equine, it's a whole lot more expensive than taking on a dog or a cat, and even those can become a problem. And so when I was trying to decide what to do um, with my animals, uh, I thought, oh my gosh, you know, I mean, I could pass on, and even though I had a ranch, I, I could pass that on to my family, and they might decide to just sell that and the animals and everything and not care where they went at all. Sure. And so that uh, kind of prompted me to get really meticulous about what I did. Ah, oh, so Good. I, uh, that's why I launched into establishing the Loveland Long Ears Museum and Sculpture Park at Lucky Three Ranch as a 501c3. And we had to uh, develop a mission to make it legitimate. And so we did that, and the mission is to teach people, and particularly at-risk kids and younger children, uh, the, about the care, maintenance, and handling and training of equines in general, and not just mules. Um, and so, but the primary focus would be mules. And that focus, being like that, would ensure that my animals would be part of the 501c3 and would be guaranteed a place in the whole 501c3 so they would be taken care of. The other thing that I had to decide was who was going to take care of them. If I just developed a 501c3 and then uh, uh, they would take on employees to run the thing, anybody could come in here that maybe didn't know anything about how to care for them and everything and mismanage it and it could all fall apart. Sure. So then the, ne and the next part of what I did, is, like I told you, was that the crew that I have working here, it's not a large crew. I've got three girls and two guys that help me run this whole operation. 132 and a half acres, 17 animals now, we used to have 32, um, and 122 acres in hay that we have to cut, bale, and stack twice a year. And that's, that's a big, tall order. We just did 11,000 bales first cutting, and we just got through with the second cutting because we grow the hay for our animals because we can't be sure that we're going to be able to find hay. I, I deal with people every day that can't find good grass hay for their animals. Sure. And of course, mules and donkeys, being desert animals, have to have a very specific diet or they can become obese and then you've got vet bells up the yin yang if they don't die. Mm -hmm. And it's really easy to mess up that program. So the people that have been with me, uh, we all uh, operate in not how many hours they put in uh, and not specific jobs. We all pitch in to help each other. Each person has their specific job 
description, but like in the hay season, everybody jumps in to help on the cutting, baling, and stacking of the hay. Chin Bailey loves it because it's a chance for her to get out of the office because she works in the office with me as an assistant. Right. Um, the, it, yeah, the other two girls, they take care of all the cleaning work inside of all the buildings, and we've got a lot of those. And we've taken on all of the call answering, taking orders, distribution of orders. Uh, we have tours that come through here, too. And so we just deal with all of that ourselves, and then the guys take care of all the outside work, which is the cleaning of the barns and the stalls and the pens. Every morning they get out there and they clean it all up so that if we've got a tour, it's all ready, it's pristine here. Also keeps the flies down, I might add. Sure. And uh, <laughs> that's really nice, you know, because people enjoy it, because when they come here, it smells good. And we're in the constant process of developing new exhibitions for the museum because if we don't keep up on that, then we might be in violation of our 501c3 status and we could have it pulled. But I guaranteed my people's jobs by the way that we structured it. And I had to hire an attorney and work with that attorney very closely when we first set it up. Actually, there were a couple of attorneys because one was a 501c specific attorney to make sure that we were doing this the right way. And then I have my regular attorneys and my will attorney and all of that. So it gets very expensive. And those of us that have animals know full well that they eat up our budget. Oh, yeah. Daily. Yeah. You know, it, it's really hard. So when you're, when you're thinking about having your animals taken care of on perpetuity and then finding people that would be willing to do that, that becomes a really tall order. Now, granted, most people aren't going to be able to go to the extent that I did. Um, and I might say right now, people think I've got a lot of money, but I, I can assure you that I don't even get enough in my trust fund to pay the, the yearly bills on this ranch. Oh, sure. All the payroll and everything else. Right. Not even counting the feed for the animals and everything like that. Mm -hmm. So I had to get a little bit smart about how to make more extra money because you, you can't do that by selling books and videos either. Sure. You know? Right. And and most of the clients that I have and the people that, you know, have animals in general, they know how to do a lot of things, small business things, but it doesn't make us a lot of money. Right. And so you got to you got to figure out how to get that extra money in some kind of a substantial lump fund. And so I consulted with a a, a financial advisor at the United Bank of Switzerland and I've been with him for 35 years now and he turned my original $500 that I saved up in the beginning into millions over wow. the 40 years <laughs> and cool. that, that's where I got the money to be able to go forward and take care of my animals and, and set up this 501c3 for them now granted you can go ahead and, and try to set something smaller up by doing what you might do by assigning godparents to a child. Right. You know. Yeah. You, you would talk to your friends and find out, you know, who's interested in taking on your mule if something does happen to you. Mm. You know, but you got to talk to those people. You can't just write them into a will and then have it just dropped on them when you're gone. Sure. Because... That, that's not really very reliable. And, and then the smart thing to do would be to open up an account where you can uh, accumulate money that can go along with that animal if you designate it to somebody so it doesn't put a financial burden on them. And that will help guarantee the care of your animal. Uh, those people also need to be educated into how to care for your animal the way that you do that keeps it healthy because there's a zillion and different one ways to feed an animal house an animal you know and one of the things that i see that's most often uh thrown around is how do you warm them how do you go ahead and get the minerals to them 
what kinds of grain can they have, what kinds of grain is not healthy for them, what kind of hay is healthy, what kind of hay is not. And when you're talking, uh, you know, mules and donkeys, it's very specific. And natural horsemanship, I love the idea of it and everything, but it really doesn't give people a realistic view of how these animals need to be treated. Sure. Because when when they're in the open and they're in the wild, which is what natural horsemanship is all about, mules and donkeys are primarily on the desert. And, and they are, you know, transversing bare ground that has a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and they graze and they move. They stop and rest when they want to. They find water when they need it. They get the minerals and everything from the plants that are out there and the the terrain that's out there, the rocks, the sand and everything. They'll lick it and they'll get what they need that way. And we have to realize that our animals are not ever going to be able to have that kind of freedom again. We have populated this country and built you know, small places where we can all be, but there's a big difference between five acres and 5,000 acres right. as to what, what happens with these animals and how natural they can be acclimated to that, that confined space. And so it's really important. That's why I say it's important that these animals uh, subsist in a dry lot with limited turnout and how do you pass that on to somebody? You know, I mean, people have jobs. People don't have time to take on an extra animal, if they even have animals themselves anyway. Sure. But but they have to, uh, if they want, if you want your animal to go on and be healthy, that's what has to happen. Right. I've seen so many obese animals out there from people that think they can just throw them out in the pasture and let them be there because there's a fence all the way around the field. And there are so many long ears, particularly, even more than horses. They tend to do pasture a lot better than mules and donkeys do. Uh, mules and donkeys colic and founder all the time, even though they tell you that they don't. Oh, they're tougher, you know, and all of this. Well, I found out really quickly that they weren't. Right, And the right. thing that got me really into all this was when I started my mule breeding program here in Colorado in 1980, um, my mother's breeding program that I worked for for six years was a lot bigger. We had 100 broodmares and eight jacks, and we did AI and all of that kind of stuff back in California. But when I moved here, I really scaled it down. Mm. But I couldn't find the oats and the grass hay that we were feeding out there. Not at first, anyway. So I took people's advice, and I was feeding half grass, half alfalfa, and uh, other other grain mixes that Purina was putting out. And, and pretty soon, after 10 years and 11 dead animals... I thought, I've got to change something here. I can't take people's word on this stuff. Oh, and yeah. I, start, yeah. I started researching. And so my program is the result of really being very careful about what I did from there on. The 11th one that I lost, it's just heartbreaking every time you lose them. And people were telling me, oh, that's just the way it happens. You know, you win some, you lose some. And... And it's just that way in the business. And I just couldn't believe that I wasn't being a bit negligent. Yeah. In the way I was doing things. Sure, so I sure. Yeah, I became somebody who asked a whole lot of questions and started doing what I call field testing on 32 animals for 43 years. Mm. And I tried everything that was out there. I tried the alfalfa, and when we started in doing hay way back then, too, and we had half alfalfa and half grass, and after I lost that 11th animal, we, we sprayed the fields and got rid of all the alfalfa. Oh, yeah. And then the, then the animals started doing better. And I, I was like, oh, okay, you know, so I started looking into uh, all the supplements that were being produced, and... Um, I thought, 
Well, there's something wrong with this, too, because it seems to me if you're going to put a supplement in an animal, you got to have a baseline and find out what they're missing first. Sure. Be- because you can overdo, and they can get sick from that, too. But I found out that Shobo from Manapro had been around for a long time and was never really advertised much except in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And people were having tremendous success with it, and so I tried that, and I had the same kind of success with that. So I checked off the box, this is what we're going to do for supplements. Then I found out that, you know, people were using all different kinds of oil to keep the you know, the moisture in the bodies for the feet, for the coats and all of that. <laughs> so I tried <laughs> Yeah. I tried a lot of different kinds of oils. Fish oil, flaxseed oil, everything that everybody uh. came up with, I went ahead and tried it. And even different kinds of corn oil. And I found out that Mazzola corn oil was the only corn oil that did not dry out their coats. Yeah. And it, and made their coats really shiny. And at one point, my vet said to me about an older mule that I had, he said, oh, well, he just needs more corn oil. And I, I, so I upped his corn oil because he was eating wood and chewing uh-huh. on wood. And I, I, well, I don't know what difference this is going to make, but I went ahead and did it. And then his coat got kind of scummy and sticky. Uh-huh. And I thought, well this is too much corn oil. <laughs> Obviously, this is not a good plan, you know. Where's the balance? What I recommend now, according to their weight, and, and I never feed them any more than two cups of oats, just oats. Right. Corn is probably the hottest stuff that you can feed them in the way sure. of grain, and it's sure. very bad, very bad for them. But the other grains are not good either, and putting molasses in them is not good either. And uh, feeding treats like horse treats and carrots and apples and peppermints and sandwiches and all these other things, I found that just disrupt the digestive tract. Right, now, right. Now, like going with this where you're passing your animal on to somebody else, um, they're going to think these things are okay. Yeah. And so you're going to get kicked all the way back to the very beginning of what I, I researched. And it's so much easier and so much cheaper to just use this program that I've developed, which gives you something that you can hand off to the people that you're thinking about willing your animals to. Mm. And you definitely need to have a lawyer write up the papers, a good lawyer, right. so that he can fill in the loopholes. You don't want somebody coming in and taking on an animal and then finding out that this person lives within the boundaries of the city or a county that does not allow you to have but a limited number of animals on a property and you they take your animal and that puts them over the top oh. and then you get a lawsuit from the city or the county telling yeah. you you can't have them wow. and then they got to sell them but this is why it's really important to you know look deep into this stuff you know, and find something that will really work. And what I'm offering people really is the cheapest way, because, you, you know, if you're going to use the animal, um, they're going to need tune-ups and stuff. But my program is simple enough so, so that people can train their own animals. I train people how to train their own animals. I don't train their animals because I found out that when I trained the animals and then I sent them home, people would have trouble with them because they didn't do things exactly the same way sure. as I did. Right, right. And then they thought I didn't train the animal, but uh. you know, it's only because a lot of people don't have time to train the animals. Exactly. And you know, Meredith. Back to uh, hiring a really good lawyer to do those agreements. I know people that have typed up their own agreement and had their friends sign off on it and then agree to what they had written. And they think that is going to seal the deal. That's not good enough in today's world. Mm -mm. You have to realize that... You know, this is heartbreaking to me, but I've watched this happen in two places. First in California and then in Colorado. I moved to Colorado in 1980 because it was like California was when I first moved there when I was eight years old. Yeah. There were open farms and highways were being built between towns 
And then I watched it in California where those cities and towns were filling up the spaces in between the big cities and farmers were being kicked off their properties. And they were being forced to do it because the planning commissions in these larger areas were making the rules for everybody else. In wow. And I found out too when I when I had to go fight with them here because they were starting to do the same thing here. And they started out by saying, oh, well, now that we're expanding the cities and everything, we have to have more rules and we have to have money coming in, revenue coming in uh, to be able to make these changes. So the horse boarding stables are gonna have to pay $15,000 a year just to get a permit to exist. Oh. And I thought, oh my God. And then these other uh, small properties, uh, people buy the property in the house and they're so thrilled that they've got a property, five acres, they can finally have their horses with them and they build a six stall barn and they want to wanna do this. And so they only have two horses, so they only take up two stalls and they rent the other four stalls to be able to pay for their horses, which kind of, you know, makes things a little easier for them. And then this this entity of commissioners comes in and says, oh no, you can't do that anymore. We have laws about developing small properties like this, and you can't have renters on your five acres. Oh. And, and that was one of the things they were passing, so they completely aced out these small properties to be able to rent out their extra stalls. Couldn't do it. I fought with that for a year, as did a lot of the other horse people here in Colorado in my area. And uh, as it turned out, we got some things reduced, uh, but not enough. And we lost a whole lot of boarding stables that just moved out of Colorado and down to Texas because the laws were a lot looser down there. But that's why I say, if you're going to will your horse to somebody or your mule to somebody or your donkey to somebody, you need to have a legal representation that can get this in writing and make it absolutely impenetrable. Because I guarantee you that the urban renewal people are gonna come in and they're gonna try to look for loopholes and they're gonna try to undo whatever you do. They're after me every day about my ranch. I'm sitting on 132 and a half acres that they wanna use for development. Oh yeah, and yeah. I can't tell you how many days, how many different things they've come after me with. And and right now, I'm dealing with are my, are my sheds out in the turnout pens legal because I built them without a permit when I didn't need it, according to code. So now they're coming after me for retro permits for those buildings. Oh my, you know, you, you've got your own Yellowstone TV series. I do, and you know, I'm really glad I watched that series because John Dutton has taught me a lot. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> Stay on top of these people. Are you kidding? You, know? you need to be on that show. You need to be directing it. <laughs> well, I think Kevin Costner does a great job. <laughs> I really do. And, and, you know, it's a, an, an incredible, you know, uh, entertaining program. But it has a, so much information to offer on what's really happening in this world to right. rural, rural people right. and how to deal with it. But you have to have the tenacity and the emotional courage sure. to go after it and educate yourself on this stuff no matter how bad it makes you feel. Right. Because right. you're going to feel better in the long run that you looked into it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I even, I even got a present from a friend of mine. <laughs> she gave me a Yellowstone t-shirt that says, please don't make me go Beth Dutton on you. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> and you wear it well, my friend. I wear it well, and it's a good <laughs> reminder to keep my, my diplomacy and my tact and try to deal with it knowing that other people have their own opinions and you may not agree with them. Yeah. But 
that that also is just that much more important when you're looking to the future of your animals. And I might mention this too, it's not a pretty thing. Uh, what I have done in, in you know, my, all of my animals, I, I quit breeding animals 27 years ago. Right. So the animals that I have right now are older and they're aged just about to die about the same time that I do. Mm. And I'm not getting any newer, younger ones because I hate it when I lose them. Oh, and I yeah. Hate it when I have to be parted from them and I can't be with them to take care of them. Sure. And so that's one consideration I have. And if I hadn't done the 501c3, I was looking at putting a, a euthanizing thing in there with me and just saying the younger ones can just be euthanized when I die because I would rather have that happen than have them go to negligent owners. Yeah. That is what happened to my, my mules that I had bred that last year, 27 years ago. I sent my daughter to a sale with four of them and she came back and she says, Mom, you're not going to like this. And I said, so what am I not going to like? And she said, well, we sold all the mules and we got a good price for them. But I went back behind the sale barn as they were loading them. And the people that bought those mules were really being rough with them and bloodying them up to get them in the trailers. Aww. And at that point in time, I decided right there and then I was not going to breed any more animals Right. Uh, to sell. Right. That I right. was going to go a different route, and uh, there were the insurance costs that came up later on on you know horse training facilities. They jacked up the insurance prices so high that I couldn't even afford to have uh, do instruction on my property or board any animals or do anything equine. Even though they said, okay, well you got to put the sign up, but then the insurance companies go, yeah, but you got to pay us this. Right, also right. Ran the boarding boarding facilities out of here so that's why I went online and a lot of people people didn't think that I would be able to coach online but I've had enough experience with mules and donkeys and horses I've been training them for 50 years mules mules for 43 or 46 years and horses for four years before that oh and, yeah and so there isn't any story <laughs> Anybody can tell me that I haven't experienced either with my animals or with somebody else's animals when we were training in person. Yeah. So um, the biggest challenge that I have is how to explain what has to happen to the people. And I've managed to break down the uh, training program so that anybody can learn to train their own animal, even people that are disabled in wheelchairs and everything else. Because it's really very simple. And I start with leading training and I start with the concept of building their core, which is a very slow process. It keeps you slow in what you're trying to do. Most of us want to get on and ride. And the first thing we think about that's so cool is the side pass. Well, yeah. you know, that's an advanced move. <laughs> that is, <laughs> I right. I that, too, after getting dumped and getting run off with and all these things, that if I just took my time to build up their bodies and make it possible for them to do it easily and for me to handle it easily with them, that there weren't, wasn't really any resistance left in the program. It took longer. But the result was I took longer at the front of the training, but I'm getting 10 years more longevity of use life on the other side. Oh, you bet. You bet. And the foundation is already there. That is what's right. so cool about your program. Yeah, and that, the thing is, you know, a lot of people deal in building bulk muscle, and they got to get ready for a show, and they're looking at the bulk muscle, and then they, ride, they wonder why their animals get disobedient and nervous for the shows and everything. Right. It's because the core muscle is missing. Yeah. And they don't feel confident in their bodies, and they lose balance, and too much is being put on them too, on them too fast. And when they, the, the thing that's the beauty about this program, which is the coolest thing, number one, people say they don't have time to do it. Well, if you spend two years 
doing the exercises in my program, it's only required, I found out by dealing with rock and roll and draft mules, who were the worst case scenario, um, that you only have to put in 20 minutes a week leading them around an hourglass pattern in a postural aid. That's yeah, it. yeah. You know, that's all I did with rock and roll, and it made extraordinary things happen in their bodies, you mm, know? Right. And, and, and it was maintained. So you do the six, six months of leading through the hourglass hourglass pattern then you do six months with obstacles then you do six months with lunging and six months with ground driving and what that does is that solidifies the core elements it's not just muscles it's ligaments tendons soft tissue is all balanced up against those bones so that when they're moving they move uh, in a symmetrical, good posture way with equal weight over all four feet through all movements. And when they go through bending or anything, the bending maintains the equal weight over all four feet and they bend through their to- torsos and they remain erect and upright in their movement, makes side passing a cinch. It's really super easy. And that's how I got sundowner to fourth level dressage. Oh, I know. I know, wow. You know, just getting that done, and here's the best part. If you've got a lot of animals, or even one or two, and you don't, you got a job, and you don't have time to put in hours on your animals or anything, you have changed the way that they move from being out of good posture, which nobody is born with good posture. It must be taught. But what you do is you teach good posture and then it becomes your normal way of moving. Yours and the animals so that all you have to do when you don't have time to work with them is just go ahead and turn them out. They're five hours a day on pasture and they'll practice it all by themselves because Hmm. they've learned to do it and it has become habitual. Okay. Now, to summarize uh, the trust agreement um, here, I'm just curious, but did your mules sign off on that agreement? Absolutely. <laughs> I like the idea. All of them do. All 17 of them do. <laughs> so and they all like all the people on my team because my team has been working with me for 17 years. I know. I know. That's have great. They all learned how to handle the animals and approach the animals and deal with the animals in a polite and considerate way with, uh, you know, learning to look at them and make sure they're still walking in good posture because all my crew knows how to walk that hourglass pattern and that's the only tune-up that you need that's right for the animals or anybody that forgets about their good posture (laughs) and this all started with my grandmother and something that she said to me she (laughs) told me a long time ago she put a book on my head and she (laughs) said Meredith you are going to be a sorry old woman if you don't learn to walk in good posture and have good manners and that is the crux of my entire training program. Oh, uh, your grandmother. Oh, I wish I could have met her. <laughs> she was an extraordinary woman, and she knew how to make an impression, but she also knew how to make things simple for everyone to be able to do it. Mm. And I think that's the thing that most people need to know, is these things are not beyond their reach that if they just kind of back off and think about things and maybe face some fears that they have about asking about things and dealing with lawyers and looking into code books and things uh, that may be very uncomfortable, what you're going to end up doing is make a, making a more comfortable life not only for your animal in the future, but for yourself going forward because then you won't sit there and worry about it you'll have it you know put together if you take the steps to do that and then you take steps every day to simplify your training program and get down to the core building stuff which is really easy anybody can do it and then your friends who you're thinking about giving your animals to 
can come over and watch you do it and participate in it themselves and that will give you the peace of mind to know that when your animal is passed on to somebody else it's going to be passed on to somebody that's really close to being just like you well meredith this you've been magnificent as always and this is really good information for our listeners so um, I want to thank you for coming on, and please tell us uh, you have a website. My website is at lucky3ranch.com. That's all spelled out, not the number three. And we also have a Facebook page at Meredith Hodges. Actually, we have two. My friend page is maxed out at 5,000, but my public figure page Meredith Hodges is unlimited we post every day and it's a lot of free information the same on my website under training I I believe that it's important to get the information out to people and they need to have it for free and everybody's on a really tight budget now but I don't think the people and the animals need to suffer because of that people are welcome to buy my books and videos but they don't have to because if you get up on under training, I've got training tips in the way of videos. I've got mule crossing articles that I've written. There's 190 something of those. Uh, I've got everything that's in the books is also offered for free. It's just not all organized neatly in a nice little book or a video for you to have for yourself. But if you want it for yourself and don't want to have to get up on the internet and look on a monitor and watch it on your TV instead or sit down and have the comfort of your living room and just peruse books, you can do that too. I try to give everybody choices. And in the beginning, I even decided that it was important to translate my manuals into French, German, and Spanish for our international friends. And recently, I even added Italian to the website. Cool. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, thank you. <laughs> well, we got a lot, of, a lot of long ears lovers out there, and we all need the same kind of help, you know, <laughs> yeah. stumbling along. Well, thanks for coming on, Meredith, and we'll, we'll talk soon. Sounds good. My pleasure. If you'd like to be a guest on the show or a sponsor, send me an email. EveryCowgirlsDream at gmail.com. Gotta go. My mule is looking for me. Meal Talk is an Every Cowgirl's Dream production.